All right, if we can get everyone's attention, we are ready to get started. So uh, I think this is a final discussion that uh, I think I'm doing. I think I've lost track, but uh, we're going to be doing a discussion right now about the two witnesses. And so this is uh, the two witnesses. I think are a fascinating subject. And so we're going to try. To, we're going to talk to Pastor Anderson, kind of get to the bottom of a few things. Um, there's a lot of confusion amongst people as far as when they show up, who the two witnesses are, and everything. And, you know, are they on the first half of the Daniel 70th week or on the second half? Um, there, so we're going to kind of talk about some of the different things with that. But first of all, uh, before we kind of get into the kind of the timing of them, just um, who do you think the two witnesses are? I think that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah come back. But it's possible that they're not. It's possible that they're just two guys that we don't know about yet. But the reason why I strongly believe that it's Moses and Elijah, I think the best evidence is that in Matthew chapter 17 at the Mount of Transfiguration, when the apostles see Jesus coming in his kingdom, he has Moses and Elijah with him. And that's a preview of Christ returning in his kingdom. And they seem to be involved, those two guys. And obviously some of the miracles that the two witnesses do uh, resemble things that Moses and Elijah did as far as stopping up heaven that it won't rain, turning water into blood and things like that. So I think there's a lot of evidence to point to the two witnesses being Moses and Elijah, but you can't really say that for certain. Is there any reason that it could not be Enoch, as some people say, since him and Elijah never died? I just think that there's zero evidence for it being Enoch. The fact that he didn't die doesn't really mean anything to me in that sense. So do you think there's any possibility that uh, as John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, that it could be two men who come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah? Sure. Yeah, it, it could be two men that are just completely unrelated and they are just men that are like Moses and Elijah. But like I said, my opinion is that it's going to literally be Moses and Elijah come back. But it doesn't have to be. It could be two men that are like them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, um, you know, some people believe that uh, Moses and Elijah come in the first half, Daniel's 70th week. We know they come for a three and a half year period. Uh, some believe the second half, I know the Left Behind series has them coming at the first half. They show up after everyone gets raptured. Uh, what do you believe, which side do well, you think they end up I don't on? think anything. It's clear and obvious, and there's no question about it, that they're in the second half of Daniel's 70th week. In fact, when you told me that Left Behind has them in the first half, I just found that bizarre. I can't even believe that. I mean, I think that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where they're getting that. It doesn't really make any sense. But let, let's just open our Bibles mm -hmm. to, the, to the main passage about the two witnesses, which is Revelation 11. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation chapter 11, it says in verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So if you look at that, it talks about the abomination of desolation talks about Jerusalem being trodden underfoot of the Gentiles for 42 months. And it's during that time, he says, that he will give power unto his two witnesses and they will prophesy. Well, obviously we know that the abomination of desolation comes at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. And it's from there forward that the two witnesses prophesy. Brother Jimenez is going to preach the full sermon on the abomination of desolation tonight. So I'm not going to go into that, but that's the time when they preach. Also, if we keep reading, it says in verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So another thing to point out here is that during their preaching, it's not raining. Well, that wouldn't make any sense in the first half of Daniel's 70th week because that is not the time 
when God is destroying the landscape and destroying the environment. That comes in the second half when uh, the environment's being destroyed. So it makes sense that it's not raining during that time uh, and all these other things, fire coming out of their mouth. That, that all fits in with the second half of Daniel's 70th week perfectly. Not only that, but right after the story of the witnesses, because they finished their testimony 42 months or three and a half years later, after they're killed and then they come back from the dead, it says in verse 13, and the same hour was there a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So notice that when the witnesses finish their testimony, and they die, and then they're caught up into heaven after they're resurrected, well, then the seventh trumpet sounds, and we're into the millennium. So that's more proof that it's the second half of the week. There's overwhelming proof. There's really no question about it. Uh, I don't know where Left Behind is even coming from. Well, and it might seem weird to even be bringing up Left Behind, but they sold millions of copies, yeah. and the doctrine is in the churches. Right. And pe people, church members read it. And so what they teach... Uh, what, what you'll see in there, they prophesy for the first half, and then, but we see that the Antichrist prevails over them and kills them. And so the way they have it, you know, and it just so happens, the time when you know, the, they're at Jerusalem, right outside the Wailing Wall, and the Antichrist does his abomination of desolation, so he's in Jerusalem, and while, after he does that, he goes and he kills the two witnesses. And so then, of course, three and a half days later, they rise from the dead. They do that whole thing. And so it, it's kind of, for them, it's like it made sense to put it there because we know the Antichrist is going to be in Jerusalem around that time. And so he's going to kill the witnesses at that time. He's getting all that victory. And so It sounds like they're just coming up with a narrative that's going to make a movie that they want to sell, but they're not really looking to the story to get the actual sequence of events. Because it's crystal clear that they start prophesying after the abomination of desolation, and it's not for another three and a half years that they're going to be killed and, and all that. Okay, and so an another thing I think it's important for you to cover that a lot of people might not know about, uh, I know you covered it in your Revelation series, but where some people get thrown on this is when you see them talking about the 42 months and then the 1260 days. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, well, seven-year tribulation, right? Well, we've got, if you do that, if they get killed at the end of the seven years... Well, now we got another three and a half days after that when they rise from the dead. So how could that be them getting killed and then rise from the dead three and a half days after everything is over? Because we are seven years into it, mm -hmm. right? Well, everything's not over because in Daniel chapter 12, it says that from the abomination of the desolation unto the end is 1290 days. So if the two witnesses start prophesying at the midpoint, and 1260 days later, they're killed, well, then there's still 30 days left to work with at the end. So that gives time for them to be dead for three and a half days, to go up to heaven, and then there's still three or four weeks left to work with. So here's what's interesting, though. If you think about this, the two witnesses are going to start preaching before the rapture takes place. Because if you think about it, the rapture takes place after the abomination of desolation, 75 days after the abomination of desolation. So the two witnesses will have already started their ministry two and a half months before we're gone. So when the abomination of desolation happens, that's when the two witnesses come on the scene. And they preach. And, and what's interesting about it, too, is that these two witnesses, their preaching is known all over the world. I mean, everybody in the world is going to hear this preaching because of the fact that when they're killed, it talks about the fact that the whole world's rejoicing about it and, and sending gifts to one another and celebrating. In fact, let's look at that in the scripture. It says in verse number seven, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Obviously talking about Jerusalem 
is the city that's spiritually a Sodom and an Egypt. And of course, we know Jerusalem is where our Lord was crucified. Mm -hmm. And it says, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now, isn't it interesting that people on the other side of the world are feeling tormented by Bible preaching? You know, people get so mad about good preaching and it just burns them up. And they could just turn off the TV, yep. turn off the radio, turn to a different channel. I mean, I just think about my own YouTube channel where there are people who watch every sermon that I preach who hate me and just comment on every sermon. And they're not even generic comments. I mean, they're, they'll be like, well, at minute 53, yeah. you said this. Like, if you hate me that much, if you hate the Lord, you, you hate Christianity. Why do you keep listening? It's strange, isn't it? Uh -huh. But people, they just, they can't just let it go. They can't just say, well, whatever. I don't believe in what these two witnesses are saying. No, it's just like, oh, these two witnesses, you know, the, the stuff that they're preaching just makes me so mad. I can't, you know, it's just, they're just tormented. They're just burned up with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's almost like the, the, on a political parallel, it's almost like the, the liberals feel about Donald Trump or something where they just like, ah! You know, they can't just ignore him yeah. and just m live their life. So these two witnesses, I mean, even people that aren't even in their geographic location just hate them, are thrilled when they die. And, 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 you know, again, we could talk about so many things, but isn't it interesting how, you know, when the enemies of our world die, they rejoice. Mm -hmm. But we're not allowed to rejoice when, yeah. when the enemies of the Lord die. Yep. Right? Like Osama bin Laden dies. It's like, woo, send gifts one to another party. Two preachers die. Woo, let's party, right? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the Orlando nightclub. Yep. How did that work out for Brother uh, Jimenez didn't work out when good. he preached that sermon? <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, clearly double standard there. And, uh, you know, it's, it, you're allowed to celebrate if Fox News tells you it's okay. Right. I think you told me that one time. And that makes sense. So, but uh, go ahead and explain real quick, because a lot of people don't understand that too, that extra 30 days that you see at the end. Explain how that works. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go too deep on that in a short discussion like this, but the way that works is that if you just do a little basic math, you'll realize that the 1260 days that we keep hearing so much about, which is 42 months of 30 days each, that it doesn't really quite add up to three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And that if you doubled it, you wouldn't quite have seven years. And this is because of the fact that a year is not 360 days. Mm -hmm. So if you take 12 30-day months, it's not a full year. Mm -hmm. It's only 360 days. So the reason why they use that calendar with the 30-day months, what it is is it's a compromise between a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. So a solar calendar is based on the fact that the Earth takes 365 days to travel around the sun. It's actually a hair more than 365 and a quarter days. So it's just a little bit different than that. Well, the moon, on the other hand, goes through its phases every 29 and a half days. Okay, so uh, if you want to take a 29 and a half day month, well, how do you have a half day in a month, right? So let's say you round it up to 30. Well, still you have a problem because then after 12 of those months is only 360 days. Where do you get the other five days, right? So what they did is they created a, a calendar that's a 30-day month. So it's pretty similar to the moon phases, right? 29 and a half days. And then what they do is every six years, they add an extra month because you got five extra days every year times six, 30 days, you throw in an extra month every six years and it fixes everything. And what's interesting is that this isn't just some theory. There are actually even countries on this earth today that use that exact calendar. For example, I'm, I'm pretty sure if memory serves, Iran uses that calendar where they have 30 day months and then every six years they have an extra, you call it a leap month. Mm -hmm. And our, our calendar isn't perfect. You know, we have a calendar that's just a strictly solar calendar, and our months have nothing to do with the phases of the moon. 
The full moon could come at any day in a month. We don't even regard that. And that's why we have strange lengths of our months. We've got 30 days, half September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31, save February with 28. Mm -hmm. And then 29 in the leap year. So there's no calendar that will perfectly synchronize the sun and the moon and the seasons and everything like that. So that's where that extra 30 days comes from. So the first half of Daniel's 70th week is 1260 days. The second half is 1290 days because of the, the extra month mm -hmm. to round out a full seven years. Right, so it, it fits perfect. It's just, I've heard people before, they kind of mock all that because trying to use math, but it's like, you know, you're forgetting a variable there. You know, you're forgetting that leap month, you know, that 30 days there. You got you to have that in there to be fair. So uh, when it comes to these two witnesses, I know, I know they're called two witnesses, but what do you see uh, is their purpose in being here and what they're doing. Well, when we think of the term witnesses, we can think of Acts 1.8, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We would all recognize that as preaching the gospel to every creature when you're being witnesses unto him. Now, what I believe the purpose of the two witnesses is is basically to preach the word of God, to preach the gospel, to preach the truth, to the entire world during the time that we're gone. So we're going to be gone shortly after they show up. So they're going to preach to the whole world. But here's the thing. They're, they're not going to be able to be everywhere at once because there are only two of them. Now they're going to reach a lot of people through technology because of the fact that there's TV, radio, internet, whatever, whatever new technologies will come even in the future. And we know that the whole world knows about them. And we know that when they die, the whole world's going to watch their dead bodies laying in the street and so forth. But still, th there are going to be people, just like there are right now, that are not tuned in to the TV. They're not tuned into the internet. They're not tuned into the radio, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people living in remote places or people who just aren't interested in, in tuning in. So that's why God has another group of people on this earth during the second half of Daniel's 70th week to preach the word of God, which are the 144,000, okay? So what I believe is that the 144,000 are going to be spread out throughout the whole world preaching the gospel in the flesh, one-on-one, -on -one, talking to people. And just like God used the 12 apostles... And he used the other Galileans and Judeans that are there in Acts chapter 2 to reach people from all over the world by speaking in foreign languages. I believe the 144,000 are going to be used to speak in a whole bunch of different languages all over the world, reaching people in remote areas, reaching people that aren't watching TV, they're not watching the computer, they're not watching uh, the, the internet. Because we're going to be gone. And that's the job we're doing right now, right? Isn't it? Amen. I mean, it's supposed to be, right? Amen. You know, so it's sort of like Faithful Word Baptist Church. We've got the YouTube channel where we're reaching tons of people all over the world. But is that really going to reach everybody? No way. There are a ton of people who are never going to see that YouTube channel. They're never going to see YouTube in the first place. So that's where we got to get out of our basement and, and face the light of the sun <laughs> and actually go outside and actually knock some doors and drive out to the Indian reservations and you know get on the plane and go to Africa and go to the Caribbean and go to all these places in Mexico and, 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 and talk to the people who, who aren't watching and, and bring them the gospel. So I think that people who, who don't use the internet, they're missing out on a way to reach a lot of people. But people who are only using the internet are missing out on all the one-on-one -on -one soul winning that, that just needs to happen. You know, we need to do both. So these are God's two programs. After we're removed, who's left to preach the gospel? You know, who's left to get anybody saved? Well, you got the two witnesses with a very public ministry. And then you've got the 144,000 that are the boots on the ground, I believe, going to every town, every village. And, and, and these guys are going to get the gospel around the world, you know, giving people another chance. And, you know, a lot of people are going to reject the gospel, of course. Mm. But I believe that many people will also be saved during that time as a result of the preaching of the two witnesses and the 144,000 Israelites. Uh, and, and, 
not to go too deep with the 144,000, but they're of the 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. They're of Reuben, Gad, Asher, mm -hmm. Simeon. Those tribes don't exist today. Mm -hmm. But the 144,000 don't come on the scene until the resurrection, mm -hmm. until the rapture. So basically when the rapture happens, those of us in this room, we're going to be going up to heaven, right? In, in the Father's house are many mansions and Christ has gone to prepare a place for us. He's going to receive us unto himself that where he is, there may we be also. So we're going to be up in heaven during the time when God's wrath is poured out. Most Israelites from the Old Testament, they're going to be up in heaven with us too, right? But these 144,000, they're not going to go up to heaven. Instead, they're going to be basically resurrected. And they're going to be leaving heaven, you know, because their souls are already up in heaven right now. But they're actually, when we're going up to heaven, they're going to be leaving heaven to come down to this earth to do their ministry of soul winning on this earth during that time. And, and so uh, that's going to be a cool job for them. And, and, and these guys that, are, that make up the 144,000, they missed out on some things that life has to offer because they're virgins. Mm -hmm. So they, they never got to have the joy of having a wife or having kids. They didn't really get to experience any of that. But they're going to get to have a special part in God's plan. That they get to uh, be on the earth during the time that God's pouring out his wrath. But they're going to be immune from it. Because some of the judgments, it even specifically says that when the locusts from hell come out and are tormenting everybody, they won't touch any of these 144,000. They won't be touched. So that, I mean, that would be pretty cool <laughs> to be on this earth while all hell's breaking loose during all of this cataclysm and just water into blood, the stars falling, just crazy things going on and locusts from hell and, and you're there, but you're immune from it. So you're not, you're not worried about it, but you're, you got a front row seat to all that. And you're going to be soul winning with people and people aren't going to be like, no, I'm kind of busy, uh, you know. Yeah. That's good. So Can you come back another time? I mean, you're going to be like, you better listen up, buddy. And, the, you know, people, people are going to be listening. Whether they, whether they receive it or not receive it, nobody's just going to blow you off. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one thing that I've, I'm hearing commonly repeated over and over again, okay, and we get accused of being the poly parrots when we quote Scripture, but one thing that I hear a lot of preachers saying and they'll kind of use the two witnesses as proof of this, as they say that after the rapture, God's going to go back to dealing with the Jews, and we're going to go back to an Old Testament economy. Anybody ever heard Old Testament economy before? I, I haven't found that term in the Bible yet, but it gets repeated quite a bit. And part of the role of the two witnesses is it's Moses and Elijah. Moses the law, Elijah the prophets. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament, Old Testament economy. Is there any credibility to well, that? Well, if you want to know where they get the term economy, it's basically they're going back to the Greek because the, the word dispensation, they're going back to a Greek word that where we get our English word economy. So that's, they're just uh, using that term. It's an Old Testament economy. So what, the, what they're trying to actually say is it's that dispensation is where we're going back to, right? Because it's a dispensational mm -hmm. thing exactly. when they bring that up. Well, here's the thing, you know, Moses and Elijah minister unto all of us every single day here in the New Testament. So we're not living in an Old Testament economy, but yet we wake up every morning and we read Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We read about Elijah and it speaks to us. So, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's an Old Testament economy, right? Yeah, exactly. And you, might, you might be able to quote this for me. But I actually agree, you could, you could say there's some symbolism in the Law and the Prophets, yeah. but remember what Jesus said on the road to Emmaus, how he, um, what verses that were talked about the law, how all the prophets spoke of me? Well, he, sure, he, he expounded unto them on the road to Emmaus using the Law of Moses and the prophets all pointing to Christ. And obviously, you know, uh, Acts chapter 10, 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So the preaching of a Moses or the preaching of Elijah is going to point people to Jesus Christ. Think about the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. And he wanted 
the, uh, Lazarus to go back and tell his brethren from the dead not to go to hell. And he said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. So today, people need to hear Moses and the prophets. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the, the preaching that's going to be going on during that time. But it's still going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be the name of Jesus that saves. There's no salvation in any other. There's none other name given uh, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Amen. So that's not going to change. Like, oh, Jesus doesn't save anymore because we're back on Moses and the prophets. God doesn't go backwards like that. Mm -hmm. He's not going to go backward to the Old Testament again. Like, all right, let's dig up the Old Testament and resurrect it. You know, it's already, it's, it's over. The Old Testament has been abolished and been replaced by the New Testament. And it's called replacement theology. Amen. And that's what the Bible says. You know, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So the Old Testament economy is not coming back. Amen. Well, I hope y'all that was a help to you. When it comes to things like the two witnesses, you know, there's not a ton of stuff in the Bible uh, about it, but it's interesting. And that's the type of thing the pre-tribbers will often grab that weird little thing, you know, from somewhere, and they'll make up a whole bunch of stuff about it based on speculation, based on some symbolism they came up with. And you got to avoid that. You got to go off the clear scriptures, the things that are spelled out. And, uh, and when you don't, you end up in great error. And so uh, thank you for that. Uh, a lot of good stuff there. And so I don't know about y'all, but I'm hungry. And so it's time for supper. So thank you very much.